say Mavericks on the you say move Mavericks on the move. Mavericks on the move. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to Mavericks on the Move. My name is Jamila Corbett. I'm the creator and host of Mavericks on the Move, where we bring together entrepreneurs and business professionals to create symbiotic partnerships. Today, we're discussing marketing strategies to grow your business. More when we return. My first guest helps businesses land their ideal clients through lead generation. Please help me welcome to the stage, Chris Slade. Your name is awesome. It rolls off the tongue really nicely. I hear that a lot. Yep. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to know a little bit about your background. How did you become a marketing strategist? Sure. Well, it all starts back in college. I was in Greek life. I was in a fraternity. And I help plan our events. So obviously right off the bat there, there's marketing that goes involved with promoting our events on campus. But one of my other jobs was to create t-shirts for our events because that was a great way to commemorate the event, get people excited about it. And through that, I got partnered with a custom apparel company. And long story short, I became a sales rep for them. And a big part of generating our sales was through email marketing. I would contact people on campus, send out email campaigns, get them hyped up about what we do. And my goal was to basically apply my expertise, getting sales made for our chapter, t-shirts made, and do that for other chapters on campus. And then I took that and ran with it. I was like, well, I see that you aren't really partnered up with any of the other colleges in the Southeast. So I was like, why don't I be the unofficial rep on those campuses too? And I basically taught myself all the basics of email marketing, how to set up an automated campaign, what people are really looking for with a t-shirt company. And I targeted tons of sororities and fraternities all over the Southeast with my email campaigns. It's like, wow, you know, I really like this. I'm kind of good at this email marketing thing. So that's kind of how I got started with marketing in the first place, how I led to where I am now. I spent a year and a half or so after my experience working for a custom t-shirt company, working for a mortgage uh, loan originator as well as an insurance. And I noticed the way that they were kind of going about marketing was very old fashioned, a lot of cold prospecting, referral networks. They weren't really doing a whole lot online. So I noticed a gap in there and decided, okay, well I can apply my previous expertise and help them do more digital stuff and get more leads online. And long story short, that's where I am now. And I really love the initiative that you took yeah. in undergrad, which helped you become the man that you are today. And we know that the digital exactly. landscape is changing the way customers connect with brands. And so how important is it for companies to develop their marketing strategy? And let's talk a little bit about the customer journey. Sure. So it really depends on what kind of business you're running, but I'll give you an overview of what the customer journey should look like. So first things first, when they visit your website, you definitely want a compelling headline, something memorable, because you got to make that first impression. People have short attention spans. You want something to stick in their minds right away that makes you unique, gives you your unique value proposition. And then from there, it's also very important to have clear call to actions on your website. You really don't want them to leave that website without at least having signed up for something or entered in their email address. From there, it's all about nurturing the lead from there. So you want to encourage them to join your mailing list or follow you on social media. And that's where you can kind of build trust, build awareness with the brand, and ultimately that should lead to a sale. And then if, assuming you do your service right and do a good job, they should become a brand ambassador for you and that's how further word gets out about your business. And that's the jackpot of marketing, Absolutely. word of mouth, because yep. we know yep. it spreads like wildfire. Exactly. And so what's the difference between inbound marketing and outbound marketing and why is it important? Sure, so that's a good question and there's some overlap between the two. Um, I would say with outbound marketing, it's a lot less personalized, and all the traditional forms of marketing probably fall under that category, cold calling, direct mail, um, stuff like that, whereas inbound marketing is more recent because online you can do content blogging, you can do social media posting, and that's a way to kind of bring people towards you versus kind of forcing the sale on them. They can kind of find you just through searching for a business like yours on Google and they find you through content or they see you uh, through their social media feed. That's a way you kind of develop the relationship organically before ever making a sale. 
And it's important to kind of have that set up as well as opposed to just looking for the direct sale. But there's obviously some overlap between the two. And let's say I'm a new business owner. Do we have any new business owners in here? A few people in the audience? So how would I go about defining my own marketing objectives if I'm a new business owner? Um, it really starts with your business goals. Where are you at in business? I would say start with why are you in business in the first place because that really needs to be communicated up front with any marketing strategy. And then I would say from there, are you looking to build brand awareness to, from the get-go, see if your idea has uh, a resonation with your market, or do you kind of have that figured out already and it's all about how can I get sales, how can I get revenue, and how much are you trying to generate right away? So once you kind of have an idea with that, it's more about um, researching your market, really identifying who your ideal client persona is, what they care about. Some ways you can go about doing that is joining Facebook groups or Reddit forums and actually seeing what they say about your particular industry. And then another thing is studying your competitors as well because you really want to communicate your uh, how you're different from someone else that they won't, might want to work with, what your positioning is. And one example of how you might do that is just look up your competitors online, see what kind of reviews they're getting, and look for the negative reviews because if you're noticing a patter pattern with the negative reviews, that might be a way you can position yourself as something different. We solve that problem that you're currently facing with that industry. And earlier in the conversation, you were talking about inbound versus outbound marketing right. and the customer journey and the multiple touch points in order to get to the sale and then create those brand right. ambassadors. And one of the ways we can do that is through webinars. Yeah, and absolutely. I see webinars, uh, master classes as people like to call them, yep. posted on Facebook, on Instagram, join my master class and learn X, Y, and Z. And sometimes this is my first time seeing, it, seeing them, but it's very compelling. So how effective are webinars and should people consider webinars as part of that lead capture? For, oh, yeah. to get people into their business? Absolutely. Um, one of the big benefits of a webinar is it's your opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge and expertise up front to people, and that's so crucial for gaining their trust. And another thing I like about it is it can be watched at their convenience from the comfort of their home. They can be in their pajamas in bed watching it. You can set it up where, yeah, you could do it live, but you can also save that live recording and promote it over and over again over time and encourage people to book a time to watch it what's, when it's convenient for them. And another benefit of it is um, it's an opportunity to interact with your audience. If you record it live, they can ask questions live on the spot. And it also is cost effective as well. If you've ever run a seminar, you have to figure out a venue, you have to figure out a time that works with your people, you have to promote it and make sure people actually show up, you might have to pay for food. You don't have to really do any of that with a webinar. You kind of just have to have some general idea of how to use the technology, record it, make sure that you know who you're targeting it to, and then from there it kind of takes care of itself from there. And webinar is considered a marketing tool. So what are some of your other favorite marketing tools that you sure. like to use? Uh, my favorite for lead capture is ClickFunnels. They are definitely the best. They are really good. <laughs> See, Jamil knows. For um, landing pages or sales funnels, what I really love about it, though, is they have optimized their site to apply to any type of business. They'll ask you up front, what is your goal? What is your business? And they'll even give you templates based on what you answer to that. Kind of give you, all right, well, this is your goal, lead gen. So you'll want to use this template, and you're in this industry. You'll want to kind of customize it this way. And they have a lot of great free and paid resources on there to kind of show you how to do it so you're getting the best results possible with that. So I definitely recommend ClickFunnels if you want to promote your business or put a webinar on there for sure. So businesses that have a good product or service but are still struggling usually have a visibility problem. So how can those businesses capture more leads and bring more people into their sales funnel? What are some ways to do that? Sure. So it's really about promoting a specific offer to a specific audience for me. I work mostly with professional service niches and they oftentimes have a lot of different services they offer and that's great, but you really want to focus in on one and promote that one specific service and then look for a specific client to promote that to as well. And a way you can draw them in is through some sort of incentive like a free ebook or yeah, a webinar that covers a topic that uh, solves a problem that they're facing 
or even just something simple as a giveaway contest where you're not even promoting the actual service, you're promoting the giveaway, and then as a, an incentive to apply for that giveaway, now you add, answer some pre-qualifying questions, and that's how you kind of get the information you need from them. So that's one example. Yep. That was actually my next question because I was okay. going to say you're giving us some great tips on how to capture those leads, but how do you act, how do you qualify them? So one of the ways is to create pre-qualifying questions, yep. right? So yeah, that's one way. The giveaway funnel example, you could build that through ClickFunnels. Say you offer a hundred dollar gift card to a restaurant, you just have to answer this series of questions that'll tell me if you're a qualified lead for life insurance, for example. You just set, answer five simple questions and even offer them a free quote at the end. Either way, you know up front what you're working with. Um, another thing I highly, highly recommend to people is have a booking calendar on your website. You don't want to get into this back and forth of, oh, just contact me here, and then five hours later, I'll contact you back. Oh, what's a good time for us to talk? Five hours later, oh, this time works. Oh, this time doesn't work with me. You don't want to get into that whole back and forth. I'd highly recommend uh, embedding some sort of booking calendar software directly on your website so that people can just easily say, okay, I see this time on your schedule. I can plug that in right away. And one of the tools I really love for this is Calendly. I use Calendly as well. Okay, there we go. And Acuity. Yep. Kind of both. <laughs> but yeah, what I love about Calendly is you can actually include optional pre-qualifying questions into the uh, booking calendar. So when they pick the time, they'll see answer these five questions or so. And that'll tell you what you're working with right up front and save a lot of time whether um, you know you're dealing with a qualified lead or not. So that'd be another recommendation for me. I love it. So I want to ask you a hypothetical question as we wrap yep. up. Hypothetically speaking, let's say you hit rock bottom okay. and you only have $50 to your name plus free unlimited Wi-Fi. What do you do? Where do you go from there? I'm glad you answered this, asked this question because I know exactly what I would do. I actually haven't tried this before, but I would like to do this because I think it'd make a great vlog series. So you want to hit rock bottom? That's what you're saying? That's, that, that, that's not what I'm that's saying. Not that's what not what saying. Okay, all right. Just, all right, anyway, just stay wait, wait, wait. clear. Let me dive in. So what I would do is I would go on Facebook Marketplace, and I would look for any kind of luxury item that is being listed for free because there are a lot of people on Facebook Marketplace that are listing furniture or whatever that they just want to get rid of, and they'll give it away for free. I'm like, okay, fine. So what I would do is I would use that 50 bucks to – rent a truck for the day, find whatever free items I can on Facebook, go out and pick them up, and then go list them on Craigslist for 50, 100 bucks, whatever, and then turn around and make 500 or $1,000 on the back end. That's what a lot of people do during garage sales as well. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> so how can people reach you? Um, platform I'm most active on is LinkedIn. You can reach me on there, Chris Slade. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and looking to kind of bump up my uh, efforts on that. You can follow me at Ace of Slades, and there's two underscores in between Ace of Slades. And then I'm also on Twitter. Not really active on there, though. I just kind of on there to follow other people, but uh, I am uh, also Ace of Slades on Twitter as well. Let's give Chris another round of applause. So I do have a question. I just started a public affairs firm and I just moved to the area and I'm having a lot of trouble doing that market research and really getting down to understanding who I even should be targeting as an audience. I have a broad idea from when I did my work abroad, but now that I'm in Baltimore, it's kind of a different place. So what would you any have any suggestions? So just so I understand right, um, suggestions on how to uh, research your market, right? Yes. Okay. Um, what's your market again? I'm sorry. So I do public affairs, so public relations and okay. government affairs. Okay. Um, one of the best resources, this is kind of a cop-out, but I would say look on a freelance platform like Upwork and okay. try to hire a specialist on there. You can usually find someone that has a specialty in what you're looking for on there, and they'll help you out with that process. Because uh, to be honest, I, I'm not – totally familiar with uh, your niche, so I'm not sure how to best advise you on that. I guess I've done the marketing on Facebook, like I've done the Facebook okay. marketing ads, but I, don't, I haven't seen them do as well as people say they've done sure. with them. Well, so. another thing you could do is create a survey and then maybe apply the idea that I mentioned earlier, yeah. some sort of giveaway funnel, so you're encouraging people to answer these questions with some sort of incentive. You, they, they're entered into a raffle to win a prize. That might be a better way to get people more activity on your survey. Okay, awesome. Yep. Thank you.
When we return, we'll hear from a content marketing maverick who believes in defying the status quo. Stay tuned. My next guest helps B2B companies succeed at content marketing. Please help me welcome to the stage, Ruthie Bowles. Welcome to the hot seat. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to dig into your background because I think it's interesting because you actually was in the military. So how did you go from the military background into being the content marketing guru you are today? Well, so I was in the Army. I joined the Army right out of high school, and I was a translator. They sent me to school for Persian Farsi, and that's what I learned, and that's what I did for about eight and a half years or so. And circumstances of life led me to separate. I got out early, and we moved to Maryland from Texas. And I spent some time as a stay-at-home mom, and then we decided to buy a house in Maryland. And I don't know if you're aware, but housing in Maryland is really expensive. I know it costs an arm, a leg, and your firstborn. And your firstborn, I did have to <laughs> give them that as well. <laughs> And so in order to avoid putting my children up as collateral on the loan, I decided to go back to work. And so I spent some time as a federal contractor, but it wasn't quite as fulfilling as my Army experience was. And I'd always loved writing. Always loved writing since I was a child. Loved to read, loved to write. And I started freelancing, freelance writing on the side because I wanted to earn a little bit of extra money so I could pay for my chickens. Chickens? <laughs> like, bark, 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 bark. were you living on a farm? We actually own two acres down near Annapolis. Okay, so you were living on a farm. Okay. <laughs> Are you still living on said farm? And we do have said chickens. <laughs> <laughs> do they lay eggs? Every day. Do you cook the eggs? Yes. Real chicken eggs. And ducks. Wow. Okay. Do you, okay, so do you cook the duck? We cook the eggs. But not the duck. No. Okay. Not the duck. Keep going. <laughs> so we had just moved into this house, two acres, and that was my, my dream. And so I wanted to earn a little bit of extra money. And what ended up happening was that the few hours per week that I spent on that as I started getting experience and more clients and learning about search engine optimization and the writing needed for that, I started becoming more fulfilled in those few hours in my part-time contract work than I was during my 40 hours a week type work. And I decided that I had worked too hard so far to let that be my life. So I decided about six months after I started freelancing part-time that I was going to try and take it full-time, which I did on my maternity leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I found out I was pregnant with my fourth child about two months after I started freelancing. And so I was probably about six months, maybe five or six months pregnant when I was like, hey, maybe I could make this a full-time thing. And that's when content and content marketing, so not just content writing, but the marketing and strategy aspect started coming into play. Um, because I realized that businesses don't necessarily have a budget for writing, but all businesses, whether they realize it or not, have a budget for marketing. Yes, they do. But they don't, but when you hear content marketing, you're like, oh, I don't need, I don't need content. I don't need that. I need someone to help me get more customers. But right. that's what content does. Yes. So, and so that's what ended up happening. I took about two weeks off after my daughter was born and then ramped up my efforts and haven't looked back since. And here you are today. Yep. And I want to touch on something really quickly because switching gears a little bit. One of the things I admire about you is that you're an awesome networker. You're so extra, you seem so extroverted and you're really good at connecting people and connecting with people. And I know that part is part of marketing, is part of your strategy. But I want you to touch on how you make it effective and how you get your ROI from those activities. For someone like me who's an introvert and I don't wanna do marketing events or deal with people, sometimes. <laughs> I love you guys, though. I love you. 
so this has definitely been a work in progress, but some of my best efforts started coming after I realized that there are about four types of people at every networking event. And the sooner you can identify those types of people, the better you can key your message to them and then kind of evaluate as to whether or not that event is for you. So I guess even before you realize the four types of people, before that you have to understand that just because you go to one event and it didn't quite feel right, doesn't mean that all networking isn't for you. It doesn't mean that all events are bad. It just meant that that particular event was not for you and that's okay. You just have to, you know, don't continue going to the same one if you feel like it's not for you, but you know, pick a new one and, and see what's different about it. So that's definitely the first step. Pick your events and find the ones where you fit in. Before you go to step two, we got to back up because I need to know the four types of people now. Yes. Yes. That's where I was going. Okay. Back. All four right. Types of people. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of the four types of people, the first one is easy. People that aren't going to buy your product or your service. Those are your non-clients. <laughs> so they fall, but even those two, that first type of pe person falls into two categories. People who are bad networkers, so it's not your fault, right? Like they're just bad. Like one time I was at an event and somebody asked me what I did. And in the middle of my second sentence, he interrupted me and started talking about what he did and handed me his card. Funny story, his company is the exact sort of company that I would attempt to work with. Not that day. <laughs> Whew. So he was a bad networker. I think he might have been nervous. I'm not sure. But he was a bad networker. The second type of person can fall in this subsequent bucket of the second type of person you find at a networking event, which is the referrer or recommender is what I like to call them, right? Because referrer is kind of hard to say. Recommender. Those are people who may refer business to you. The trick about these people, though, is that you don't know who they are until they do it. Ooh. You never know who that person is until they do it because you do not know all of the people that they know or that they will come to know. So if you get a good vibe with them, if you like them, but maybe they're just not a good fit for your business, they have the potential to be a recommender for your business, right? And then the third type of person is our favorite type of people, right? Our prospective clients or customers, people who are in the category of buying our product or our service. So those are also a category of people. Those are the third type. And, and they're pretty easy to spot. And then the final type of person, which is the person I feel most people don't consider, is the connector. The connector might be the sponsor of the event. They might be the organizer of the event. They may be attending the event but organize other events or be on small business development boards or organizations. These people are also pretty easy to spot, especially once you get them talking because they talk about their other events. So they're easier to spot than a recommender because you don't know who the recommenders are. A connector, though, is somebody who knows a lot of other people, people who you may be able to work with. So those are more strategic partnerships where you have your business development. So those are what I consider the four types. Man, you gave a lot of meat and potatoes there. We could just stop the show right now because that is jam-packed full of value, right? Yeah. Just that right there. Yeah, you guys can clap. That was awesome. That was awesome. So switching gears again, back to content marketing. <laughs> For new entrepreneurs that are a little wet behind the ears, can you explain what content marketing is and why is it important? So I'm going to start with the second question, why is it important? And the reason why it's important, content marketing is important because I would hazard a guess that almost everybody here in the audience and everybody watching this video right now are already doing it. Content marketing is the content and that's video, it's written, it's audio, it's images, it's anything you put out there as representative of you and your brand. So if your business, if you have a Facebook page, if you're on Instagram, if you're on LinkedIn and you promote your business, you are already doing content marketing. So this is why number one, it's important to any entrepreneur who's hoping to make a splash in the digital space about their services or their products. So are there any content sources that yield the most return and does it depend on the industry like B2B, B2C, professional services, etc.? It always depends. It always depends. So 
if you're, let's take the first uh, division that you created there, B to C and B to B. So if I was a B to C, business to consumer type company, let's say I'm in the fitness space, Instagram would be a place that I would almost have to be. All of my competitors will be on Instagram and it's a very visual type platform. You take photos and you post about those photos. So whether it's a product or maybe you're the athlete and you're looking for sponsorships, whatever it is that your business happens to be, fitness and Instagram go really well together. That being said, it's pretty crowded. So maybe I take a look at a more non-traditional platform one where B2B businesses typically congregate, which would be LinkedIn. I knew you was going to say that. You know how I feel about LinkedIn. And you know how I feel about I LinkedIn. Do. <laughs> I do. I like how compassionate you said that. <laughs> so if I was a fitness person and I had either a product or I offered fitness services and I felt like Instagram was getting a little crowded for me, you'd have to imagine that there are a lot of people on LinkedIn potentially entrepreneurs, people who work behind their computers, who would be interested in getting fit. So sometimes it depends, but it also really depends on your messaging. If you were a fitness person and you wanted to make a splash on LinkedIn, you would just have to tailor your messaging to the people that you're targeting, right? But if you're B2C, you can't avoid being on Instagram. And if you're B2B, you kind of can't avoid being on LinkedIn. But you can make splashes on other platforms. So it's possible, but it all depends on your messaging. And let's talk a little bit about content sources, video, white papers. Like if I'm in the fitness industry, would I necessarily put out a white paper? But maybe if I'm in the cybersecurity industry, I might put out a white paper. So can you talk a little bit about the content sources and what will be important for each industry or give examples of a couple of industries that will be the content sources would be important for? Absolutely. So I really like that you brought that up about the, the fitness space. So depending on your product, if you were a, a fitness business, let's say you sold fitness equipment, right? So you would have that B2C angle where maybe you would use Instagram or Facebook for that. But you would still have a B2B angle if you were looking to work with wholesalers and distributors to get your products onto retail shelves. So a white paper may serve you better there as a, a way to show how you differentiate from your competitors. So white papers are particularly valuable and case studies are particularly valuable with a B2B audience. So if you have a product, even if it doesn't seem on the surface to be B2B, but you're looking to get it through wholesaler, wholesalers and distributors who make larger orders, then a white paper may benefit you. But again, looking at something like cybersecurity, you would almost guarantee that they would have a white paper, particularly for something like services where you can include numbers and prove the effect of your services. So for people who don't necessarily have a tangible product, white papers can also help you differentiate yourself if you have a product that's similar to someone else's. You have to kind of show how you put your secret sauce on there. Now, video is important because they're saying, you know, video is increasing. It's going to take up like 80% of the Internet, you know, before all said and done. But you always have to consider your market. So for me, as a writer, if your target was more writers, let's say you sold a, let's say you sold a freelance writing coaching program, videos can be very valuable. But I can read faster than you can talk. And most of the writers I know feel that way. So if you do a video please put the transcript, for example. But there are other people who video is just, they don't really want to read, they would love to watch your videos. And so it's all about knowing your audience. So, and then you can't forget the written stuff. Like video is really popular and I feel like it's the shiny new thing online. And so people are like, oh, I don't need to write things anymore. But that's just not true. What if I don't have time to watch your video? What if I still really want to know what it is that you have to say? And it's also a lot easier for search engines to crawl, which is when you know Google goes on your website to see what's there. It's easier for search engines to crawl and then index your written text than it is for a video. And even when they're looking at your videos, they're probably reading the subtitles. If you post your videos to YouTube, the subtitles get automatically generated. So that's kind of nice for you. That's a pro tip, you guys. Pro, pro tip. tip. <laughs> And so video, of course, is incredibly valuable. And then I'd also like to touch on images, right? So people feel like, oh, you know, I'm on Instagram, but I need to have a professional photographer and I need to put out all of this money. Well, the numbers actually say that you don't. 
I think it's around 60% of consumers will trust what they call user-generated content, meaning phone, uh, pictures that look like they were taken with a phone. They will trust that over branded company content because they feel like it's coming from a real person. So that's user-generated content. So even if you're just getting started and all you have here are like, hey, I've got my products here, I can take pictures of me using them, I can take pictures of my family using them, take those pictures. I tell everyone, start where you are. Yes, absolutely. Because if you don't have the thousands of dollars for a professional photographer, then you just don't have it. Google how to take awesome photos with your smartphone. And they will teach you tricks for lighting. And hey, this is how you set up the background. And you can make it look very good. I totally agree. And that leads me to my next question. Because business owners, entrepreneurs, we're very ambitious. Some people think they're going to put out a piece of content. And automatically, boom, I'm going to get a customer. So let's mm, set the expectations. Realistically, what's the ROI time on putting out content? So it definitely depends on how you've identified your goals. So when you're looking at content ROI, just like any other type of marketing, it has to be tied to a business objective. So if you're a new entrepreneur and you're just trying to get you know, word of mouth going, you're trying to increase your brand awareness, then a metric that people often call a vanity metric, i.e. a metric that sounds really good, but it's actually not important, your followers on your social media handles. A lot of marketers will say, oh, those are vanity metrics. They don't matter. But if you're looking for brand awareness, reach, then those sorts of metrics would matter. If you have a new website, you wouldn't necessarily be tracking conversion rate, the people who give you their email address for your free ebook. You wouldn't necessarily be tracking that up front if your website is new. So you would be looking more at site traffic, which could also be considered a vanity metric. When you're looking at engaging in content marketing, you have to give it I would say somewhere between six to 12 months. So think about, think about content marketing as kind of like your retirement investment. Long account. game. A long game. You don't invest money every month into your retirement account and wake up expecting to see, oh, look, there's a million dollars in that account. I do. Now. I'm just playing, I don't. <laughs> Are you working on your manifestation? Is that what yes. you're doing? <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Well, so my retirement account is kind of set it and forget it. But in terms of content marketing, there are a lot of ways that you can use content in the short term and still count on those, that long-term return. So in the short term, when you do something, let's keep it simple, you make a blog post. I send that blog post out to my email list. That includes current clients or customers and prospective ones, people who've shown that they're interested. Maybe I talked to them at a networking event. They said I could put them on their email list. So I email it out to them. So now they're checking out my content. When they click that link and they check out your content, that's building that brand trust. And they're also learning how to trust you. They're, they're seeing what it is that you've got, basically. And we talked about the sales funnel earlier with yes. Chris. Yes, and, and, and it all ties in because without great content, it's hard to build that trust. And that is exactly what it is that you're looking to do. And so again, same blog post. Now I'm putting it out on my social media channels, right? And so anybody who's in my social media channel will be able to see what it is that I've got to say there as well. You will typically see, and especially as an entrepreneur, you will typically see business partnerships and marketing opportunities come forth from your content marketing efforts sooner than you would see sales. But that's not always a guaranteed thing. I've been working really hard on my LinkedIn for, I would say, probably since the turn of the new year because I, I was on LinkedIn. I had my profile nice and it looked good, but I wasn't really quite as active as I would say. Probably me. Probably, yeah, probably you. Your profile looks good, but you're not super active. But yeah, so I was you like six months ago. But since then, I've gotten podcast interviews. I've gotten requests for guest blogging, which has kind of helped me get into different industry spaces. But then Instagram. In the last 30 days or so, I've decided I'm going to try really hard at Instagram. You know I love Instagram. I know you do, but I'm a writer, so I can't just take pictures of my computer screen all the time, even though I do do that sometimes. But what I've been doing, I've been working really hard on Instagram. I haven't gotten any clients from there yet, but what I have gotten are two opportunities to be interviewed, one for a small digital magazine and another for somebody's blog. And then Twitter is something I've been making a go at as well, and I got another request for an interview. So these marketing opportunities are showing up, but only because I showed up. And that, I think, is probably one of the most important things. I'm showing up without the guaranteed 
or without a guarantee that I will actually, you know, quote unquote, make money for it. But there are a lot of intangible benefits as well. So money, obviously, money is what helps keep our businesses going. But it's, it's like I said, it's like a, ret a retirement account. It's a long-term investment. Give it six to 12 months as you put that content out there. You build your credibility. You build brand trust. And that is when things start to come in. But don't be surprised if you get one or two that pop up ahead of time, especially if you meet them in person at a networking event and then your, your content on your website just kind of backs you up, it backs up that first impression that somebody got from you at an in-person event. And so you can kind of see how all of these things start to play together and how you can leverage you know, one type of marketing as you engage with people in you know, a different arena. But what would you tell the person that says, mm, my content is going to be boring, I have nothing to say? What would you tell that company or that person? It's not boring to people when they need it. Ooh. Have you ever had, or maybe you know somebody who's had a crisis with their taxes, right? So maybe they, they decided to try and file their taxes themselves. If you're a small business owner, I highly recommend against this. <laughs> but maybe you decided to try. Maybe you thought it would be simple. Imagine how comforting it would be to find a blog or YouTube channel that just walked you through it step by step. You know what? Come to think of it, random, something random. I was trying to fix a the camcorder that I have from like 2009. And I'm like, how do you fix uh, yes. Sony H whatever the brand is? And I'm like, oh, this is how you fix. I would have never searched that if I didn't need that information. You're so right. I would have never watched that video. Right. And it was a crisis for you at it that was. moment because you're like, I need to know how to do this. But especially if you look at something like taxes or finances or try to look up information about the stock market or information about content marketing, there's a lot of stuff out there that is full of jargon. It's, you know, it's easy to understand for people who are already industry experts, but that's not the person who's searching for your information. So if you're out there looking and you've got this crisis and you find somebody who explains it to you in a way that you can understand and helps you solve your problem, you've already got their, their trust and they're probably going to recommend you without even contacting you. Hey, did you have trouble with your taxes? I had trouble with my taxes. You should go to this website. And you know what? I might actually give them a call. I don't know because I really don't want to have to go through that again. I might have just messed up my quarterly taxes. <laughs> Let's hope that. Right. I, I don't do my own. <laughs> so when is it the right time to hire someone like you? I would say that if you're looking at outsourcing content creation, so whether you're looking at, okay, the, the content's gotten too much for me to do, and I, I want to do it well. I want it to be done well because quality over quantity 100% of the time you're looking at hiring somebody to write your stuff or help you shoot videos or do your images, that might be a good time to also look at somebody who does strategy. And so whereas my, my company also offers content creation, which is the writing and then kind of you know, pulling those things together, we also put a lot of emphasis on content strategy because it's really hard for businesses to measure ROI without a strategy in place. And so strategy should always be tied to business objectives. So it's not about, hey, I just had a great idea. We should write a blog post about that. It's not to say that'll be completely ineffective, but how are you tying the hours that you spend on that blog post? And if you don't spend hours, then you're probably doing it wrong. But <laughs> if, how do you tie those hours to actual business results? Like if you're not tying them to a business objective. So at about the time I would say that if you're really deciding to make content strategy a real or content marketing a real part of your marketing strategy, it would be great to at least sit down and speak with a strategist to see if, you know, now's a good time. Because if you're, you're working with a strategist, the strategist will help inform all of your other efforts. They will be able to help you create the plan that tells any writers that you hire or maybe employees that you have that write, it will tell them what it is that they need to do. Because not all content writers, they're not all of them are content strategists. They're not going to be able to go out there and tell you, hey, these are the topics we need to hit first because your competitors are or because no one is and this is just this would be a coup for you to touch on this topic on your website so i would say any time that you're looking to really invest your time in content marketing you should you know take a look around and see if a strategist would be able to help you make the most of your efforts and how can people reach you 
Well, in case you didn't notice, I am pretty much everywhere right now. So Defy the Status Quo is on LinkedIn, and you can look me up on LinkedIn as Ruthie Bowles. On Twitter, I'm Anna Ruthus. That's A-N-N-A-R-U-T-H-U-S. Don't judge me. I've had that account for a really long time. No judgment here. <laughs> and Instagram, we're Defy the Status Quo Biz, because somebody took just Defy the Status Quo, and they don't, I don't know. But so that those are really the main areas where you can find us and just online to find the status quo.com. Let's give Ruthie another round of applause. So my question for Ruthie is about content. I've heard two different things about how your headlines should be. One say they should be really open-ended questions that talk about what your niche is. And then I've heard others say that it should be more specific statement that tells people what you do up front. Which one do you think is best? I would definitely say the latter. I've come across way too many websites where I start scrolling and I'm not actually sure what it is that the person does. And that's not the feeling that you want to have them carry through your website. Because instead of appreciating the content that you've got there, they're scrolling to try and find the answer to their question, which is what the heck does this you know, company or this person do? So I would definitely say the second one. It should be very clear and upfront. This is what we do. And if you can tie into that statement, kind of this is who we help, then you really answered the top two questions that most people have when they hit your homepage. Okay, and I just had a follow-up question. I wanted to know if you take content that's already there and help small business owners figure out what to keep and what to get rid of and what to edit? Yes, I do actually. So we typically call those content audits and it's something that a content marketer or strategist should do as soon as they take on a client and what it helps you do is that is, so it's hard to believe, actually, that you would actually want to get rid of any content, right? It's, it's hard to believe. You're like, why would I get rid of this? I worked hard on it. Yeah, it's not the greatest, but I worked hard on it. The thing is, is that the search engines will actually downgrade your lower quality content. So it's not to say you should, you know, only keep your very tip top stuff. But if you've identified content that just doesn't hit the mark, then it's better to go ahead and let it go. Now, it's not to say you have to completely get rid of it, but if you've got blog posts where you're like, hey, these weren't quite it and I could definitely do better here, then you could take those and breathe new life into them. And that's actually a, a really great strategy to use because that uh, URL has already been you know, saved by Google. So when you add new content to it, it gives Google a reason to take a second look. And, and the age of the page, right, so how long that page has been in existence also plays into your search engine ranking factor. So it, it's, it's a really good strategy to use. And actually, most blog posts have a lifespan of probably about a year if they're really in-depth. Now, it could be less depending on your industry. If, if new things are coming out, you know, if you're in a medical field and new advancements have been made, then those blog posts need to be updated. If you're in a technology field, then you might need to keep your blog posts on a review of about six months because if the technology is different, then your content is now obsolete, just like the previous iteration of that technology. So a content audit is something that should definitely be done whenever a new, uh, new client's taken on, and, and that will help inform your strategy and your efforts moving forward. So this is a follow-up kind of to that question because there are some companies that can run the same content over and over for years. So how important is it for new and fresh content and does it matter of the age of the company? So it doesn't necessarily matter the age of the company, but if you've ever done a Google search, have you noticed yourself checking the dates on the results that you're getting? So if you asked a question, you know, perhaps you were asking reviews for Mavericks on the Move, would you pay attention to a blog post that said 2015 or would you pay more attention to a blog post that said 2019? Which one are you going to click on? So it's not to say that Google doesn't feel that the 2015 review is, you know, is important, but the search intent there for me is to know you know, I want to know how it is right now. So I would definitely favor the 2019 post. So, so age comes into play. So age is great for search engines, but you can still keep that age while updating your content, keeping it fresh for the humans. And that's always your goal. Your, your goal is to help 
Google or any other search engine, connect your content with the people who need it. So your end, the person is who you're focusing on. And so that's why content updating is really important. And you'll notice that even for companies that keep blog posts up for a really long time, as they should, they will update them. And you can typically find notes there where it'll say originally written in November 2015, updated January 2019. And that is how they tell you this piece of content's been around, but we've been paying attention and now we fixed it. So what would be the first steps uh, to take as an entrepreneur or a small business owner to start with producing content? Know your customer. As people, our inclination always is to talk about what we want to talk about. That is always our inclination. But that does not necessarily line up with what your customers or clients want to read or hear about. So it's really important that you always put your customer or client first. And so this is kind of ties into what Chris was talking about earlier with the market research, but really digging deep and figuring out what it is that people want to know. So for me, I like to go on Quora because people are asking questions. Reddit is another good place to kind of dig in deep. Even if you don't participate, you can go and look on Reddit and see what it is people are talking about in terms of your industry or products. And then also looking at what your competitors are doing. And then if not your competitors, maybe companies you know who are where you are or who are where you'd like to be in five or 10 years. Take a look at what they're doing because they have a lot of resources that you as a single entrepreneur do not have. But what they're doing could give you hints to incorporate into your own content marketing strategy. But definitely know who your audience is and focus on them and resist the urge to talk about what it is that you want to talk about unless it also lines up with what they want to hear. Last question. So a lot of people use their background to help them in their new um, business endeavors now. So how has the military shaped you for your business now? Has it helped you in any way? I would say that it has actually. My time in the Army actually gave me the resilience and the courage to even start my business. I figured that if I could do a year in Afghanistan and, you know, be mortared and come out okay from that, and if I could survive that time separation away from my family, if I could deal with people yelling at me in my face, if I could handle having to yell at other people <laughs> and, and managing programs. I managed programs of 200 plus soldiers at one point and, and mentoring and all of those things. If I could do those things, then I could start this business and I could make it successful. So there were, there were key characteristics I think that you'll find in a lot of successful entrepreneurs that even if you don't have them or you don't consider yourself having them, you can cultivate them. And resiliency is a huge one. You have to be able to bounce back. We will constantly fail. There are things that we try that just don't work. And, and sometimes we try them and they don't work, but that doesn't make them a bad idea. We have to have the resiliency to look at them and understand why they didn't work. Is this still a good idea? And to look at it and to, and to understand, hey, maybe I need to ask for help. So they're, they're, the characteristics are definitely key. And I would say that resilience is probably one of the biggest ones that I learned in the Army because they don't let you quit. You sign up, I, my first contract was five years and the second one I signed was six years and you can't just hand in your 30 days, like you cannot quit. So if I can't quit, then I have to make the most of, make the most of it and, and, and be as strong as it is that I can be, especially once I started leading people and being an example. So yeah, I would, I would say that my background, huge. When we return, we'll hear from business owners in the audience. Stay tuned. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Jody Marlowe and I am your healthcare coverage advisor. I try to help small businesses, self-employed, 1099 contractors, anyone that is on the Maryland Health Connection, I can help you save money on health insurance and get you a great plan that fits your budget and your needs. So if you are pay overpaying or you think you're overpaying, call me for a free consultation. I would love to have a quick conversation with you. And I'm also in the process of doing a nonprofit. So that is my why. 
Thanks, call me, Jody Marlowe, 443-829-2574. Hi, my name's Christy Sachs, and I'm a mindfulness and meditation teacher, and my company is This is the Only Moment That's Real. Your past is your depression, your future is your anxiety, and your stretch is, stress is trying to control these things that don't exist. If you're having any of these issues, please contact me, Christy Sachs, at This is the Only Moment That's Real, and I'll be happy to help you. Hi, my name is Kelsia Barnes, and I'm the principal at Barnes & Associates. At Barnes & Associates Public Affairs Firm, we handle all of your needs, whether it's public relations or government affairs. On our public relations side, we work with publicity. If you're someone that has owned a business and is ready to take that next step in your brand, we can help you get into conferences, podcasts, blogs, and any other sort of media. And if you're on the other side of it, which is government affairs, and you need help with advocacy, if you're a, a citizen who wants to see a bill passed, or just to organization that's looking to up their work in the federal and state areas, I am that person for you. Kelsia Barnes, Barnes & Associates. And that's today's show. Thank you so much for watching us. If you're catching us on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Give this a thumbs up, share it out, and comment. Remember, each one teach one, each one reach one.